Hello there. Today, I'd like to take you on a guided ASMR tour of the Cluny Museum in Paris. This museum, which has the official title of Musée National de Moyen Âge, is the Museum of the Middle Ages, a collection dedicated to the art and artefacts of the medieval period. Today's tour is going to be based on my last visit to the Cluny, which happened while there was some restoration work going on in the museum. So, if you visit the Cluny Museum for yourself, you might find that the layout of the rooms has changed a little from the way I'm about to describe them to you. Nevertheless, if you enjoy wandering around museums, or if you have a passion for the medieval world, you will hopefully enjoy this audio exploration. As usual, I'll illustrate our visit with some photographs on the video, but there's no need for you to look at them if you don't want to. I will describe the rooms we visit so that you can just close your eyes, relax, and let my voice guide you. So, welcome to the Cluny Museum. Before we begin, let's take a moment to look at the museum from the outside. The building is one of the best preserved examples of medieval architecture in Paris, and it was built in 1485 as a mansion house for the Abbot of Cluny Abbey. It features many of the classic elements associated with Gothic medieval architecture such as carved gables, spires, pinnacles and stone gargoyles, which jut out dramatically from the building's façade. There's also an enclosing wall around the museum that has a crenellated top, so that the whole mansion looks rather like a miniature castle. But although the Cluny looks like a perfect medieval townhouse, it holds a much older secret a Gallo-Roman bath complex that was built around the 1st or 2nd century AD and which would have housed a huge network of public pools and bathing chambers. By the 15th century, when the Cluny Mansion was built, the baths were mostly in ruins. But rather than pulling them down, the medieval builders incorporated the Roman remains into the structure of the new house. And this means that, as we explore the museum, we'll discover a fascinating combination of two eras of history and two very different styles of architecture. Let's enter the museum now and walk through the temporary exhibition rooms to a corridor that is lined with alabaster reliefs. Turning to our right, we can step into a small and very dark room, which holds a beautiful array of medieval stained glass. Most of these glass fragments have been salvaged from the broken windows of old and magnificent cathedrals, and this room has been very cleverly designed to showcase them. Each piece of glass has been illuminated from behind, so that... Within the darkness of the room, it glows with rich colours. Azure blues, deep greens, fiery reds and golden yellows all shine out from the glass. And standing in this room is a bit like being presented with a sumptuous selection of giant jewels. Returning to the alabaster corridor, we continue down a flight of stone steps noticing, as we go, the huge carved medieval tombstones that have been mounted on the walls on either side of the staircase. We then turn into a large and lofty gallery that is made partly from the walls of the original Roman baths. This is La Salle de Notre Dame, and in here, we'll find artefacts that were salvaged from Paris's great cathedral. The most striking items on display 
are a selection of rather curious giant heads. Carved from limestone, they're mounted in rows around the room, so they almost appear to be floating. Who are these strange disembodied giants? The answer lies on the western facade of Notre Dame Cathedral. If you were to stand facing the main entrance of this magnificent church, you would notice, above the three main doors, a long row of kingly statues. These are meant to depict the ancient kings of Judea. However, when they were originally carved in the 12th century, the medieval sculptors took their inspiration from what they knew. So the kings ended up looking more like medieval French monarchs than ancient Judean patriarchs. This, perhaps, accounts for their fate. In 1793, at the height of the French Revolution, an angry mob mistook the statues for representations of French royalty, and, in a fury of anti-monarchist fervour, they attacked the western façade of the cathedral, pulled down the statues, and decapitated them one by one. After this rampage was over, most of the statues' heads were collected together and buried under the foundations of a house, where they lay hidden away for nearly 200 years. After the revolution, Notre Dame Cathedral fell into disrepair, and it wasn't restored until the 19th century, when a new set of replacement statues was made for the western façade. By that time, Everyone had forgotten that the heads of the original statues still lay undiscovered in the dark earth, and they weren't rediscovered until the 1970s, when the house under which they had been buried was refurbished, and the builders who were digging on site were surprised to unearth 21 giant medieval heads. I will pause here to note that if you're interested in learning more about the turbulent years of the French Revolution, there's an excellent trilogy of history ASMR videos on the subject by the French Whisperer, which you could always listen to after we've finished our tour. For now, let's draw nearer to these imposing stone heads and take a closer look at them. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, many of the faces are damaged. Parts are missing and some of the features have worn away. However, in spite of this, you can still make out the king's crowns and diadems, their beards and moustaches, their eyes and mouths. Even after all these centuries, every stone monarch still carries his own unique expression. Solemn, or watchful, or stern, or sad. For over half a millennium, these kings stood watch over the people of Paris from their high seat up on the cathedral façade, and now they are safely preserved here in the Cluny Museum as an extraordinary relic from a bygone age. Leaving La Salle de Notre Dame, we'll continue down the stone stairs and enter another part of the original Roman baths, the Frigidarium. This was the cold room in the bath complex, where citizens would cool down after their communal hot baths. Large and lofty, the room has an immensely high vaulted ceiling and is a very impressive sight with its Roman arches, high windows, fragments of mosaic and tantalising traces of original wall art. You can also see, in an alcove on one side of the room, the original sunken tank, where the Roman bathers would have refreshed themselves with a cold bath. And next to this tank, there are four large, carved stone fragments, which are all that is left of a 2,000-year-old temple, dedicated to the Roman god Jupiter, that once stood on the Ile de la Cité, where Notre Dame Cathedral is today. Continuing on, through the Romanesque room and the Gothic room, we can admire archaeological fragments from three great former abbeys of Paris, Saint-Germain-du-Prés, Saint-Genevieve 
and Saint-Denis. Most of the relics in these rooms date from the 12th century, including another striking limestone head, which originally came from Saint-Denis, and which now stands on top of a pillar at the entrance to the Gothic room. Unfortunately, damage to the head means that the features can only really be seen on one side of the face. Nevertheless, it's possible to tell from the elegantly carved stone that the statue is meant to be a woman, and in fact, it's a representation of the mighty Queen of Sheba, who first appears in biblical accounts of King Solomon the Wise, but who also features in many other legends across several different cultures. Once we've finished admiring this array of cathedral fragments, we can climb up a staircase to the first floor of the museum, where we'll find ourselves in the long Du Sommera corridor, which is named after the founder of the museum. From here, we can enter the goldsmith's room, a gallery that is dedicated to the artistry of medieval craftsmen who worked in pure gold. This room is filled with glass cases, displaying the most wonderful, gleaming treasures. Gold shines out bewitchingly on all sides. But, as with most medieval items of value, the majority of the pieces on display in here were made for religious purposes. There are many golden reliquaries on display, which look like jewel boxes, but which were actually made to hold religious relics, such as the bones or body parts of saints. This practice of preserving holy body parts might seem rather strange to us today, but the owning of such relics was a conventional practice in the medieval era, and the churches that were lucky enough to hold very famous relics would have benefited from thousands of visitors who made pilgrimages to worship the relics, sometimes every year. Many of the reliquaries in this room, like the reliquary of St. Thomas Becket, have a casket shape and are sumptuously decorated with gemstones and brilliantly coloured enamels. However, some of the reliquaries are a little bit more eccentric, and as you walk around the room, you might be surprised by the sight of a curious golden foot which was made as a reliquary for the actual foot of St. Adelard. Another unusual piece in this room is a whimsical-looking golden pigeon with hinged wings, which is decorated with precious stones and layers of blue and turquoise enamel. This pigeon is actually a peristerium, a vessel shaped like a dove that was made for storing the consecrated wafers used in the ceremony of the Holy Sacrament. It's a very striking and unusual piece. However, my favourite exhibit in this room is an exquisite rose, which has a long stem, delicately traced leaves, and three beautiful blossoms, all made from the purest gold. This rose was created for a 14th century pope by an Italian master goldsmith, called Minuccio da Siena. But to me, it looks as if it might have come straight out of the pages of a fairy tale. I could spend all day admiring the many golden treasures in this room, but the most dazzling objects in the museum's collection are still to be discovered. So let's continue through two more rooms lined with yet more beautiful stained glass and enter the gallery that holds the most famous exhibits in the Cluny Museum, the tapestries of the Lady and the Unicorn. My goodness, these are magnificent. There are six tapestries in total, all hanging in sequence around a large room, which has dark painted walls to make the tapestries stand out even more and heighten their wonderful glow. The tapestries are all quite large, mainly between three and a half and four and a half metres, although each of them has a slightly different shape. Are you as amazed as I am by the depth of the rich colours? 
the details in the weaving, the beauty of the scenes depicted in each tapestry. Why not take a seat on the heavy wooden bench that sits in the middle of the room while I describe to you each tapestry in turn? All six tapestries were woven in Flanders, in Belgium, from wool and silk at around the beginning of the 16th century. Each one depicts a different scene, and for five of the tapestries, there's a general consensus among academics about what those scenes mean. They're thought to represent each of the five senses. Taste, touch, smell, sight, and hearing. Let's begin by looking first at the tapestry dedicated to the sense of taste. It depicts the scene of a medieval lady standing in a circular garden at the centre of the tapestry, with a white unicorn on her left side and a golden lion on her right. The lion holds up a fluttering swallow-tailed pennant on the end of a long decorated pole, while the unicorn holds up a rectangular flag on the end of a similarly decorated pole. Both flag and pennant bear the coat of arms of the house of Le Viste, so it's assumed that the tapestries were commissioned by a member of that family. Between the lion and the lady, a maidservant kneels on the ground, holding a golden dish. The lady has one hand on this dish, as though she's taking something from it while in her other hand she holds a green parakeet. From this circumstance, scholars have concluded that the lady is taking a sweet from the dish, which she is about to feed to the parakeet, hence illustrating the sense of taste. This theme is further delineated by a monkey who is sitting in the foreground of the tapestry and who also appears to be eating something. All the figures are standing or sitting within the circular garden, which has dark green turf covered with tiny, jewel-like plants and flowers. Beyond the garden, the background of the tapestry, which is woven in a rich red colour, is also studded with the same pattern of exquisite tiny flowers. This design is repeated in all six of the tapestries, and it's known as mille fleurs which means thousands of flowers. There are other animals sitting amongst the millefleur. Two dogs accompany the lady in the garden, while there are many sweet little rabbits hopping about in the background. There's a fox on one side, another monkey clinging to a branch, a leopard, another cat of some sort that could perhaps be a panther or a small lion, some birds flying overhead, and a couple of other animals that look as though they might be goats. Accompanying this menagerie of animals, there are also some trees and bushes in the garden, which are laden with colourful fruits. And, taken all together, the profusion of flora and fauna gives the scene a sense of great abundance and harmony. It's perhaps meant to represent an ideal landscape, where all creatures live together in peace and plenty. The second tapestry, which illustrates the sense of touch, has the same abundant millefleur setting, with many animals still living together in apparent harmony. However, one note of discord has been introduced into the scene by the monkey, who has been chained to a weight and is no longer free. He sits with his head down, holding on to his chain with one hand, and this is perhaps meant to draw further attention to the central theme of touch. The lady, meanwhile, stands at the centre of the garden as before, with the lion and the unicorn. She holds a flag in one hand, and the unicorn's horn in her other hand, further underlining the theme of touch. However, The maidservant has disappeared from the scene, and the lady remains alone in her garden, with only her animals for company. In the third tapestry, the maidservant has returned, and is holding a dish of carnation flowers, 
a couple of which the lady has taken up in her hands. There's a further basket of carnations sitting on a bench behind the lady, and the monkey, who is now once again free, is sitting on the rim of the basket, smelling one of the carnation blossoms. This indicates the theme of smell, the third sense in the series. Once more, the lion and the unicorn are in attendance, holding up their pennant and flag banners, while a variety of animals and birds are nestling in harmony among the beautiful mill fleur in the background. In the fourth tapestry, the lady is once again alone in the garden with the lion and the unicorn, and the unicorn has knelt down and placed its front hooves in the lady's lap. She holds up a golden mirror to show the unicorn its reflection, and this illustrates the sense of sight. The setting for this scene is a little simpler than some of the other tapestries, although the background of beautiful mill fleur and animals still remains. The fifth sense, hearing, is represented in a more complex scene with the lady and the maidservant standing on either side of a small, but quite sophisticated-looking, pipe organ. The lady is playing the organ, while the servant girl appears to be sorting through sheets of music, and the organ itself is sitting on top of a table, which is spread with a richly embroidered cloth. Once more, the lion and the unicorn are in their habitual places, on either side of the lady but they have swapped banners. The lion is now holding the rectangular flag, while the unicorn is holding the pennant. Another thing to notice is a nice little detail that has been woven into the depiction of the organ. At either end of it, there are two small decorative finials, one carved to look like a tiny unicorn, and one carved to look like a miniature lion. Each of the five senses has now been represented. So what about the sixth tapestry in the series? What does that represent? Academics have theorised about its theme for centuries, but no one can say for certain what the tapestry is supposed to represent. It's different to the others in a number of ways. To begin with, it's the only tapestry to feature a large blue tent which has been erected in the centre of the garden, with its guy ropes tethered to the trees on either side. The lion and the unicorn have lost their banners, and are instead holding open the tent flaps, while the lady stands at the entrance to the tent, holding a necklace. The maidservant stands beside her, with an open jewellery casket in her hands, and, written across the top of the tent, is the phrase, A mon seul désir which literally translated means, my only desire. This scene, and the accompanying text, has been interpreted in a number of different ways. One popular theory is that the sixth tapestry represents a sixth sense, a feeling or intuition that lies beyond what we can experience with our five physical senses. This theme, it is argued, is supported by the fact that the lady appears to be removing her necklace and replacing it back in the jewellery casket that the maid holds. The theory goes that this action signifies that the lady is renouncing the material world and its treasures in favour of a more metaphysical inner world. However, in reality, it's not known whether the lady is removing the necklace or whether she is about to put it on instead. If she's about to clasp it on, then the scene could in fact represent the opposite. It could be a celebration of material wealth, rather than a rejection of it. Or it could be commemorating a marriage within the Leviste household. Or it might have some other meaning entirely. We simply don't know. And it's this mystery, lying at the heart of the tapestries, as well as their incredible beauty and harmony that makes these wonderful hangings so spellbinding. The enigmatic nature of their message leaves us free to ascribe any meaning to them that we like, and perhaps it is this ambiguity 
that has made the tapestry so compelling through so many centuries. Everyone who comes to the Clooney lingers in this room to gaze upon the magic of the Lady and the Unicorn tapestries. But there are still many other treasures to explore in the museum. So let's move on now and walk back through the stained glass rooms into a gallery that is lined with wooden choir stalls. These stalls were made for the Abbey of saint Lucien de Beauvais at the end of the 15th century, and there's more to them than first meets the eye. The wooden stalls hold a secret. At first glance, they appear to have fairly plain and ordinary seats. However, each of the seats is actually hinged and flips upwards, revealing underneath a small ledge mounted above an intricate wooden carving. These secret carved ledges are known as misericords or mercy seats, and they were designed to give the abbey monks a ledge to discreetly rest against while they were supposed to be standing up during long religious services. The most interesting thing about the misericords are the carvings beneath the ledges. Each one is different, and many of them depict mythical creatures, such as dragons or mermaids. Or they show comical scenes, such as a pig playing an organ. Because the ledges were only ever meant to be used while the monks were standing in front of them, the carvings were never meant to be seen and this gave the medieval woodworkers a chance to be playful with their designs and include a few irreverent visual jokes. Beyond the choir stalls are two interconnecting rooms, the first of which is a gallery devoted to medieval treasures, which includes an impressive golden altar front made originally for the cathedral in Basel in Switzerland. This altarpiece was commissioned in the first half of the 11th century, which means it's close to being 1,000 years old. In spite of this, it looks as gleaming and beautiful as it must have done at the time when it was made. Beyond the altarpiece, in the next room, we'll find the original chapel of the Clooney Mansion, which has a very dramatic vaulted ceiling, carved in the Gothic style and is decorated with niches made to house statues of the family of Jacques d'Amboise, who was the original owner of the Clooney Mansion House. You might wish to stay for a while and admire the Gothic carvings in this chapel, but once you are ready to move on, we'll retrace our steps back past the Basel altarpiece and the choir stalls, and walk into the last remaining wing of the museum. The first gallery we come to is dedicated to religious devotion, which was a very important part of medieval life. The room contains many artefacts that were made especially to encourage worship at home, including several pocket-sized reliquaries, a few portable images of saints, and a gorgeous selection of small, illuminated books of ours. These are exquisitely decorated with gold leaf and vivid hand-painted miniatures, and they were made to inspire their owners to prayer and religious contemplation. However, I think that even people who aren't religious can still be inspired by the wonderful colours and beautiful illustrations in these fabulous little books. In the next room, we'll find more secular items from the Middle Ages. This gallery focuses on domestic life, and it includes examples of medieval board games and playing cards, as well as dinner plates and glasses, and interior fittings and furnishings. One of the most striking exhibits is another cycle of six beautiful tapestries. Known as the Manorial Life series, the tapestries depict a group of richly dressed noblemen and ladies who are going about their courtly pursuits in an idyllic millefleur forest setting. Their activities range from traditional outdoor pastimes, such as falconry, picnicking and promenading in the woods, to more domestic occupations, such as needlework or even taking a bath. 
Perhaps we wouldn't necessarily expect such private activities to occur outside, in the middle of a forest. But nevertheless, they create colourful and interesting scenes that further enliven the luxuriousness of the Manorial Life series. The final room we come to in the museum is given over to warfare, hunting and tournaments, and the artefacts on display include a very interesting manuscript from the 15th century called A Treaty on Combat. This illustrates the many techniques of warfare that were used in the medieval world, and it's complemented by various displays around the room of swords, cannons, armoured helmets and chainmail, as well as a selection of beautifully decorated shields. One of the shields depicts the biblical scene of David defeating Goliath, and presumably this scene was chosen on purpose to rouse the hopes and stiffen the nerves of the soldier who bore the shield, especially if the odds of battle happened to be stacked against him. Once you've finished browsing in this final room, we can walk down a carved wooden staircase at the end of this wing and return to the ground floor of the museum. Perhaps you would like to stop and linger in the museum bookshop. There are certainly many tempting volumes in there for enthusiasts of medieval history or history of art. After that, you can make your way out into the cobbled museum courtyard and back into the fresh air and sunshine. Our tour of the Cluny has now come to an end, and I hope you've enjoyed this exploration of the museum and its wonderful treasures. I hope, too, that you'll be able to join me again soon for another ASMR adventure. Until then, thank you for your company. Goodbye.